John, we're back. I don't know which session this is. It could be five already. <laughs> John right, Volker, yeah. life business executive coach. How are you? I, I brought all my unread books. Yeah, I'm loving it. <laughs> um, listen, could you just pull one down from the shelf and show me one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how are you doing today? Oh, I want to ask all you right. a question. Now I'm going to reverse. I'm rewinding. I'm rewinding. Um, what have you learned this week? Ooh, I have learned this week that you do not have to answer every question that you're asked. I like that. That's a brilliant lesson. You answer the question that you want to answer, even if it wasn't asked. Right. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting doing this like in a, with a significant other or something like that. I'm just saying that maybe in a business context or if you're a coach or if you're a leader that sometimes, and this is so hilarious because this happened before we started recording. Sometimes there's a trap in the question or there's an assumption baked into the question that's asked and you end up responding to that assumption. There's some special term for this. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't work. So you asked me, what is it like to, what would, what you, you said, what is it like to live in a dictatorship or something? I did pose that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take the bait. So <laughs> another one, <laughs> there's an interesting tie in here, maybe, because I know you've been doing some workshops for, I think, new coaches or something. Uh, exactly. And recently I was having a new coach practice on me. And they asked a question that I absolutely hate. And I couldn't figure out why I hated it. And you might appreciate it or not. But the question was, we were talking about uh, with some professional, the, my topic was like some professional designation. Should I go get it? Should I not? Do I care? And they asked me, well, how do you feel about that? Ooh. And so I was like, like ah! the therapist head on. Yeah. The, that's, well, the, the first place I went was like, yeah, I had the twitch of like, crap, I'm back in therapy. No, I'm not. What is this? And then I was like, I just don't like that question. And then I remembered from my coaching training that that was not a good question, but I couldn't remember why. And I was assisting a CTI class a couple of weeks ago. And I asked one of the instructors who, like yourself, is a th was a therapist, is a therapist, and also a, lead a coach. And her response was, there's an implicit assumption baked into that questions that question that feelings can that that situations can make you feel a certain way and her her stance was we're always at choice i was like oh i love that i i totally believe we always have a choice even when we're unconsciously choosing and feel like we don't wow. so yeah. how is that for like the long-winded What's going on? How am I doing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great because actually instantly it triggers uh, for me that, you know, and why it's not the best question to ask is because it has to be a balance. I'm, of course, interested in, in what people feel in a certain situation because that can govern how they act, right? Thoughts drive feelings, drive actions. It's cognitive behavioral therapy. But thoughts drive feelings drive action so to ask someone how they feel is not balanced unless you're comparing the difference to what they're thinking in a situation so i could be in a situation where i think i'm right i'm feeling annoyed the action that i then display is eight-year-old super brat so being able to distinguish between my thoughts and my feelings, for me, is like an emotional audit. But just Ooh. to ask me how you're feeling, there's no benchmark to that feeling. There's no gap to analyze the relevance of that feeling. So for me, I, I would never teach coaches to you know, ask that question because unless you've got someone lying on your couch, it doesn't, it doesn't seem relevant unless somebody maybe needs to cry a little bit. And yes. by asking them that question, you can trigger an emotion. Yes. And, well, I don't know that I would try to trigger emotion, but in my own work, I'm speaking to what I'm seeing. So right. if someone is getting visibly angry 
or there's tears or they're just really distraught, I might ask them, you know, what's here? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to assume it's a feeling or that they're feeling a certain way. I mean, I also did a Myers-Briggs assessment recently with a team and found out that my particular one, like, accessing feelings is really hard, which no surprise to me. So when you ask me how I'm feeling, it's like, uh, oh, I'm supposed to know, and I don't know, so now I'm really screwed. <laughs> yeah, and, and but but actually, you know, I think if you ask that question and someone doesn't know, that in itself can be quite liberating. Because we don't always so? know. Because we don't always know what we're feeling. I think it gives us a chance to audit ourselves, to, to look inside. Sometimes... I wonder, and maybe this is more from a therapeutic approach than a, a coaching approach, but people aren't always that comfortable to look deep inside, in spite of the fact that they know everything they're going to see. <laughs> right? Because there isn't anybody who knows me better than me. Right. <laughs> in spite of what my mum might say, which, apart from my mum, there isn't anybody. <laughs> so, you know, don't don't misguidedly assume that because I'm smiling, I like you. And <laughs> don't assume because I'm scowling, I'm angry. Um, but to your point, you know, if you see, if you're coaching the moment and you see an emotion, then I think, you know, the coach's job is to hold a mirror up. And then yeah. it's much easier yeah. because it's like, hey, listen, I can see instantly that just when I ask that question, tears start to come into your eyes. What's going on? And yeah. then maybe the floodgates open and you have to create the safe space. But it could also be, you know, that somebody sits upright, they become a bit prickled, and you hold the mirror up and you say, hey, your whole body language has changed just then. What's going on? And I think it's it's the coaching the moment, I think, is one of your phrases, right? Yeah. Um, that's coaching the moment. But, hey, how do you feel? It seems like a, a lazy coaching question. <laughs> yeah or a or a, I guess I call it a crutch question it's like oh no I have no idea what else to ask I'll ask you how how you feel about this <laughs> which there's better I think there's better crutch questions I mean one of my favorite crutch questions is what's here now like or I have no idea where to go next my mind is blank what's coming up for you yeah yeah, that's that. There is that sense, isn't there, with when, when training coaches, when working with coaches, that the coach always has the question. And I know that, you know, even on a workshop recently with this group, one of the questions that kept coming up was when they're practicing mini coaching conversation, like not role plays, more skills practice, they're getting caught up in this idea of they're trying to listen but they're trying to work with a new model in front of them and they're trying to work out what the next question is. So they're not really listening. And it's like, that's just a, that is not a virtuous circle. <laughs> oh, but it's so painful and so real. It is so, it is so, no, and that's where, I don't know if you and I have talked about this, but this is where I feel like the power of listening from your body is so valuable because oh. Well, you can't be listening. You can't be taking in. You can't be listening and processing with your mind at the same time. I don't think, not very well. Mm. Whereas when I'm when I'm just kind of, I can feel the I'm 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 hearing what's coming in, but I'm not trying to think or decide or to process. But I'm feeling it more. Like I feel it more in the middle of my body. Oftentimes when that person is done speaking, maybe there's a little silence, like something just comes out of my mouth and I don't know where it came from, but I like to think it came from my body. It came from spirit or where, like wherever those things come from. But have you always been like that? Because no, no, no. to me, no, that, that's experience teaching you to trust your intuition where you could be totally present for the individual and then respond in the moment often i say to coaches uh, to coaches look sometimes just sit and listen 
And the last thing that that person says, you can turn into a question that moves them forward. Way, way, way. Yeah. How did you learn to trust that intuitive response mechanism? Because that's training that you've done. In yeah, life. it's, it's, well, and I call it making the continuous journey from my head to my heart. Um, that sounds like a book. You should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's behind me. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it when we're done. Um, I think it came over it came over time. I remember leaving each of my coaching training classes that were in person. They were three days, they were intense. There was no PowerPoint. No, it was it was very experiential and very I remember leaving those classes with my heart just like sometimes torn wide open. Just I remember just walking through the airport and just like sending love to like everyone in the security line and just and just just feeling this like openness and this like oh wow what's going on here what am i sensing what is um because the training was like three-dimensional it wasn't just how do you be a good coach and ask the right questions it was what's going on in the room right now yeah what's the energy in this space so i'd walk into the airport and I'd be like what's the energy in this security line and i'd be like wow it's really angsty it's really like people are kind of torqued today and then i was playing i was i was pointing this out to my wife recently we went to the grocery store like at a certain time when nobody was there and i said did you notice the vibe of the store she's like what do you mean i said well it was just there was just a level of like calm and tranquility and i said other times i'm in there and it's completely different so back to your question how it's it's practice it's failing it's it's getting too stuck in my head when i'm talking to someone like or or if i'm ever in a situation where the roles kind of get reversed where suddenly the person i'm coaching is kind of leading the session <laughs> which i'm not saying that's all bad but sometimes that happens and then it becomes like this thinking game of like <sighs> Whereas if I remember in those moments, no, return to your heart, return to your heart, return to your body. What's your, what's your body have to say about what's going on here? A lot of times then the stuff shows up. So I guess it's a, it's a practice. It's a trusting. It's a, it's a realizing that yes, in the moment, I can trust the moment. And this happened in one of my classes where I was really frustrated with how the class was going. And I went and talked to the instructor and said, you know, this is, and his encouragement to me was, okay, tomorrow when we start and there are questions or comments about what you're learning, it was the third day of the class, I want you to immediately raise your hand. <laughs> Even if you have no idea what you're gonna say. <laughs> And it scared me to death. Right. I can't remember if I did it. I think I was like the second or third question. And I didn't know. I, I just raised my hand. And then he called me. And I said something. And I was like, ooh, this kind of works. Like this kind of something came to me in the moment. So it's a, it's a practice. I think for coaches who are in training, there's a sense of having to learn the structure and the process of coaching and it's so easy to get and actually it's it, it is easy to get caught up in the process but it's also easy for you and I to sit here with experience of coaching and say no don't get caught up in the process you, know, <laughs> you, you and I both know um Tim and uh, we'll leave it just as Tim Oh yeah, I love Tim, and uh, and I worked with Tim uh, last year uh, on developing him as a coach, and uh, he said to me in the, like the third session, he goes, Brad, you know, and Tim is is like super laid back. I, I always used to say to Tim, if he was any more laid back, he'd like float under the door. Um, and he says to me, Brad, you know, this whole formulaic approach to the conversation, I can't bear it. Basically, I don't even think i'm doing i'm so worried about which stage of the model am i at <laughs> that i know i mean you can hear him saying this probably that 
that, that I just can't be coaching. And I, I just said to him, listen, next time you're in a session, forget the model. Don't go in with a model. Just go in wanting to understand the story more. Just take it from there. Trust that your questions are right going to cut to the core. And you know what? He sent me a recording of this session. He spoke less. He spoke with vigor when he asked a question. And at the end, the guy said to him, his coachee, that was a really powerful session. Thank you. And in that moment, Tim totally tipped and became a high level management coach. Like, I love it. Because he forgot the process. I love he, it. He now knows the model. He knows grow and gold and drops and coach. <laughs> and, you know, all the models that are out there. But what he actually does is he listens and he just asks simple questions. Simple questions. Because it's the simple questions that are the most difficult to answer and the most powerful to ask. There's you nowhere to hide. Right? You don't, exactly. You don't. Somebody shared with me, uh, was it yesterday? It was a brilliant question. She just said to me, you know, what do you want right now? I mean, that's brilliant. I said, where did you get that question from? She goes, no, it's my favorite question. When people are stuck, I just say to them, what do you want? Like, what do you really want? Mm -hmm. And people aren't comfortable saying that out loud. It's almost as though they're, they don't have permission to be completely honest. And I think those simple questions, the models are there, yes. They're structured approaches and formulaic approaches to a structured conversation. But the magic of coaching comes in the simplicity of the question that they haven't thought about answering. Mm -hmm. If I try and intellectualize it, I just disappear on my own backside. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible image for anyone listening or watching <laughs> our, our episode. Um, take me back, though, to um, this sort of trusting you, your intuition, because... What happens when you do trust that intuition? You do ask the question, and then you're faced with, you know, a completely blank response. You know, the lights are on, no one's home, uh, that person can't think straight, nothing's coming out. Do you just leave it in, in silence? Like, how do you handle the time when you've got that coachee that can't respond to that simple, brilliant, intuitive question? Sometimes the question doesn't like, well, I, I'm, I'm going in three different directions. One, I guess, with intuition that I learned early on, not from myself, but someone I was practicing with is listening to your intuition is, it's a marker. Like it's, it's, it's like a, it's like the dashboard dummy light on your car that goes on. It says engine check. Mm-hmm. But you don't really know what it means. You might have an idea. So that, I guess that's my best example of intuition. Being aware of when the light comes on. Is the light on or off? Oh, the light is on. Hmm. Well, here's what I think it is. I'm going to blurt it out. And it might land and it might not. Right. And when I say intuition blurt out, I'm, it's not like, well, here's my best advice for you. It's... I'm getting a sense of asking about this. I'm just going to ask like some random question about what's it, what's, what's it like on your team? What are your team meetings like? I don't know where that question came from. It just like popped. So that was my intuition. They might say, well, I don't have team meetings. That's such a stupid question. Why would you ask me about my team meetings? Don't you know that it's like, oh, wow. Okay. I can see the, the, like, Wow, what's it like to be asked about a situation that doesn't apply to you at all? Well, it really makes me mad because that means that you don't even know who I am. And like, how can you be my coach? And oh, wow. A lot going <laughs> in, other words, here. <laughs> in other words, suddenly, suddenly my question that was just totally out to lunch mm -hmm. has landed us where this person 
apparently really needed to go because there's some real charge here. There's some right. real, and so, so it's it's that process of not being an unattached. I mean, unattachment is huge. Oh, the the light came on. I'm feeling a question coming up. I'm gonna ask it. It didn't land. So what? Now what? Oh, it landed and the person is in tears and I'm a masterful coach because I asked them the most powerful question in the world. Well, don't get used to that because it won't last. Like, well, <laughs> Maybe you should write that down in your folder entitled Powerful Coaching Questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't laugh too loudly. I, I can remember my first ever coaching session. The guy's name was Mike Bailey. He was head of a hardware technology company. And uh, we got some coaching. This is like way back in 1996, John. So like nearly 25 years ago. And I, I went with a, a brown leather folder. And inside the folder, I had two pages of A4 printed out. In the header, it said, powerful coaching questions. I'd even put a, you know, a date. Stamp. Oh, no, I'm Dying. Oh, I'm dying. This no, is so John, cringeworthy. I used to tick the questions off as I asked them so I could then reflect back into how many, how many powerful questions <laughs> <laughs> I'd asked. Um, I don't use that anymore. Good, good. Oh, that's a relief, Brad. That was going to be my next <laughs> question. Like, how listening. many of you ticked off in this conversation? <laughs> but to that point, I think, you know, and you started by saying, you know, it's about when we're coaching coaches. I think we have to respect the fact that when you get started, it's a bit like driving a car, right? Um, when I learned to drive, I learned to drive with my hands at, you know, quarter to three or 10 to two. And I check my mirrors before I signal and maneuver. And, um, you know, I, I don't wind the window down or, you know, I check over my, my shoulders. There's a, a formulaic process to doing everything when you're learning to drive. And I suppose what we're really talking about here is that kind of conscious competence, unconscious competence. So yes. for people wanting to trust their intuition, it needs to be a conscious level of competence to start with. They need to start checking. And I like your idea of when the light comes on, because when the light mm -hmm. comes on, it does, it shines a light on us. We've just got to see it. And if we're so ingrained in our models or so engrossed in asking the right questions, there are no right questions. There are just questions. And what I try and impress upon people that I work with and train, it's keep those questions simple. I don't want a gothic novel of a question. <laughs> and only ask one. <laughs> oh, please. That's something <laughs> else, right? There's, there's nothing. And that just kills me on the podcast that I listen to. You know, well-known person I won't mention. They'll ask like three questions. Then they'll do their own mental processing about the questions and the situation they just asked about. And by the time it gets back to the person they're interviewing, the person's like so confused, like, oh, they'll be like, that was a really great question. And it's like, well, which one? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I call them piggybacks. And it's, no, and it's, a, it's and again, I'm, I'm making it sound like I have this mastered. I do not. I still catch myself and will often just stop and say, you know what? I just asked you two questions there. Let's back up. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to ask you a completely different one now. Here's the, here's the latest question in my mind. Uh, but back to your whole thing of like, how do you do this? It's, it's just, it's, oh, I got this from my own coach recently. Like I had asked, I had a whole agenda and his response to like half of my topics was listen better, listen better, listen better, listen better. And so it's in that listening better that you listen to them and you're listening to yourself. And if, especially if you're in touch with your body, sometimes someone will say something, I'll get a shiver. To me, that's an immediate cue that something happened. I don't even, and a lot of times, all I have to do is say, that just gave me a real shiver. I'm not even sure what it means. 
what's going on over there? Oh, yeah. when you asked me about this and I shared this and that led to this, that just unlocked this whole new idea that I have for like what we could do next year in terms of this new product. Oh, okay. <laughs> Again, I'm just playing back what I'm experiencing, but I'm not attached to it. I don't know if it's right. I could have said I had a shiver and they're like, well, I don't know what's wrong with you. Nothing's happening over here. Okay. I think what you're describing for me is a deep state of engaged listening. Yeah, and presence. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm not here to answer your questions. I'm here to question your answers. Whoa! That should go in a book somewhere. Okay. But but for, for me, that's that's the, the magic of coaching. So, you know, to your point, when a, a coachee maybe throws questions back at you, it's like, look, I'm not here to answer your questions. I'm here to question your answers. I'm not here to ask you great questions. I'm here to question your answers. And I've always held that dear. Um, it's my take on, on listening to great coaches give talks, podcasts, read books. And the theme that always comes up is, you know, it's not about me. It's all about you. Because that's the mantra, you know, even now, John, before every session, whether it's at 5 a.m. in the morning when I'm getting on a call with someone in Australia, or it's 8 o'clock at night and I'm getting on the call with someone in the U.S., every time before I click admit into the Zoom room, I say to myself, Brad, it is not about you. This is all about them. And that somehow centers me into this deep, engaged listening where if they are willing to pay me for the next 90 minutes, the very least I can do is be totally present. So it's not about me. Yes. I think that helps the engaged listening state that then helps me move quicker to a point of being able to help unlock something in them, which will make it a valuable session. Yes. And I would say like back to the new coaches that are like, but how do I do this? I love your, I love that gave me a shiver as you were sharing that. I have a similar, I have a different ritual, which is I like to at least have at least five minutes. 15 is ideal. Everything's set up. I'm at my desk. I'm just chilling. There's nothing to do. And in my best moments, I close my eyes for 10 minutes and then maybe open them five minutes before so it doesn't look like I've been asleep. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a complete like stillness. And it's, it's like the mental thing of, John, return to your heart. Get in your body. Are you in your... And so just, I can do it in a couple minutes now. I'm just sitting just silently and just, just kind of feeling it just sink. And it's like, okay, if I'm coming from there... I know everything's going to be okay, even though I have no idea where this is going to go. I might even be nervous. I might even be like, oh, I'm really, finally, after almost five years, I'm going to probably screw it up today. <laughs> and it doesn't happen. But yeah. We did a really good exercise yesterday, actually. So we started a program yesterday with a client uh, on developing accredited coaches internally for this uh, time. And I wanted to show the difference between kind of having a mentoring sort of role <laughs> you think you're coaching <laughs> uh, fake coaching <laughs> right and when you're actually coaching and listening so i gave them this first exercise where um they had to ask so what's the latest challenge you've got on your radar right now and then the coachee talks for a minute and then the coach gets to give them advice on how they can fix this problem and they get up to 60 seconds to do it. So they, they go into a little breakout room, they do this exercise, they all come back laughing and some of them are going, oh, wow, I got some really great advice and, and, and it's great, right? It's, it's, it's set up perfectly. Next time, we swap the rooms around so you're now with somebody different so you can bring up the same problem. They bring up the problem. This time, the coach has four minutes and can only ask five questions. And I've, I've given them the questions, so they can ask them in any order. They're the kind of questions that will land at any time. And they're really simple, like, what should your attention be on right now? 
What do you really mean by that? What do you really want right now? What's getting in your way right now? You know, they're, they're, at any point you could throw that question in and then the person would have to keep moving. And then I brought them back into the main room and it's like, okay, so how was that? And they're like, oh my God, I just came up with my own answer. I've been trouble, you know, struggling with that for two weeks. And it's like, now, are you mentoring or are you coaching? And they're like, oh my God, I'm just mentoring. The whole, I, meant, I thought I was coaching, but I've been, and I think it's just doing lessons like that when you're training to be a coach, where you train to listen and really simplify everything that actually our, our job is, I think, equally humbling as it is challenging. Because what you're doing, and a, a new member of the CTG team joined me on this course to observe yesterday, and he said what he learned was that when you coach, you give up your right to speak. Because you don't bring the content. Think more about that. You give up your right to speak. Yeah. But how can you ask questions if you're not speaking? So not completely. But okay. A, a lot of managers, when they're asked a question, they lean into their experience and they speak a lot. And what he was recognizing when you're coaching, what you're doing is you're saying, do you know what? I'm not going to speak now. Here's the question. You answer it. Yes. And if you need to sit there silently for the next two minutes while you think about it, I'm cool with that. Yeah. And new coaches, that's a hard one. Right. The 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 sitting in the quote awkward silence, it's only awkward if you make it awkward. It does not and that's a mindset thing that I it, it's a mindset body thing that in some of those moments of like Oh no, my mind says this might be getting awkward. It's just like returning to my heart and it's just like, what am I sensing here? What am I sensing? What am I sensing? I'll know when it's time to say something. I right. guess it's not time yet. Correct. And sometimes I can think of the longest time I've been silent. I can still remember it was, it was just over 70 minutes. 77? Seven? Seven zero. Where I didn't speak. The person just kept talking and talking and when they came to a pause i just knew it wasn't right to ask anything so i just kept silent and then they would carry on and then they would carry on and then they would pause and i each time there wasn't a question to come up they were just they were working through their story and working to their solutions and discounting solutions and coming up with new ideas they were having a whole conversation with themselves and it showed me that it's a choice. Uh, and you said uh, before, you know, we've always got a choice. And I think we choose to stay silent. We choose to deeply engage. We choose to listen. We choose to ask simple questions. We choose to stay quiet. That's the job of the coach. And I would add to that too and say, there are moments where I think it's okay to be a mentor. Or to even be a, like, and I think there's a fine line between consultant and mentor. My definition would be mentor is I'm going to give you advice on how to solve your problem. Consultant would be I'll give you the advice and or I will just solve it for you. <laughs> so me, if, and, and I've seen this somewhere where someone's like, well, I'm a coach. I can't give any answers. This was my early trap. I'm the coach, so I can't give any answers at all. And I can't talk about myself whatsoever. Yeah. And th after people were like, well, I kind of want to know who you are a little bit or like, come on, don't you have any good books on this topic? Like, haven't you studied this at all? It's like, OK, yeah, then you can say, OK, I'm taking my some people like to do this. I'm taking my coach hat off and I'm putting my mentor hat oh, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, you it sounds like you really, really want to know my experience on this. And I'm a little, OK, We'll spend a tiny bit of time and I'll tell you this one situation I was in and how I solved it. And, oh, you want a book on that? Here's a couple of them. I don't know if they're the best books. They've worked for me. Okay, back to you. Like, what are you going to do with this now? But in other words, I guess, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, yes, it's okay to answer questions and give advice. And I don't like to spend very much time there. And I think what you described there for me is ideal because I've got no problem 
if I've asked two or three times, you know, what do you think you would know about it? What do you think you can do about it? And I'm like, there's nothing coming up for this person. You know, you don't know what you don't know. I don't need to make them feel like a complete muppet, you know, that can't answer a question. Right. And so they throw back at me, well, Brad, you know what, you know, what would you do? I say, listen, let me, sh- I'm going to share a story with you. Um, and I'll tell a story of either what I've done in that situation or someone I know. But the aim isn't to tell the story, so I don't replace my hat. What I do is I, I share the story, and then I finish that story with, so, John, listen, having heard that anecdote, how does that help you with where you are right now? Oh, that's beautiful. That's much smoother. I like it. And then we're back to, we're back to coaching because right. I shared a two-minute story with you, and I, 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 I always say, you know, for me, If I'm training you, that's when I put the best of me into you. And it's all about upskilling you. When I'm mentoring you, I'm sharing the meaning of my experience with you. So it's about wisdom. Ooh. And there's a place for that. Of course. That's beautiful. And and the skills are are intertwined between coaching and, and, and mentoring. But when I'm coaching you, which is all about ability, it's about you improving and enhancing your ability, then my job is to get the best out of you. So when I train, I put the best of me into you. And when I coach, I get the best out of you. But when I mentor, I share the meaning of experience. So if I'm going to tell you a story, it's not about the story. It's what you do with the story. (laughs) Otherwise, why was I sharing that story with you? Just to tell you a story about me? No, yeah. that's just the wrong way round. Right. <laughs> um, talk to me a little bit about um, difficult coaches. Um, you know, the kind of coachee that struggles with self-realization, struggles with self-awareness, struggles with overthinking or underfeeling or overfeeling and underthinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's an, ar- an array of coaches out there for all of us um because intuition and that kind of approach d- does it work for every- i feel like i'm interviewing you on your coaching star here so uh, f- forgive me if it feels like that no i didn't but you know it does it, does intuition work for everyone does that kind of push out style where it turns out okay. you and you kind of sh- say hey listen this is I feel like I should ask this, so I'm going to. What happens when people aren't responding, when they're tough and nuts to crack? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think, I think that's a beautiful reminder that, at least for myself, that's when I tend to crawl into my head. That's when I start to have those oh crap moments of, oh no, this isn't working. I'm not this isn't going to work. What will I do? In other words, that's when I start living in my head more and more trying to like strategically respond to them versus the intuitive presence. What's going on in my body? What am I really, what am I really sensing here? In other words, the tables just got flipped or not not the tables flipped. And I'm not, in other words, wait a minute, we're no longer coaching. And am I making up a story that like, oh no, I'm not the coach anymore. I've lost control of this session. What does this mean? What do I do? What is like, if I go and get all caught up in that, right? I'm not listening for what's really going on. I'm not speaking to what's happening. I've, I've, I'm all in my head. I've lost. Yeah. I've lost the plot as a coach. Um, but what you have? What was your original question, though? What happens when uh, people don't have those high levels of self awareness? They overthink or underfeel or underthink and overfeel. Where maybe I think the intuitive response doesn't quite sit. Yeah. So I'm. I think there, there's a certain element of meeting the person where they're at. Go on. Maybe in those situations, there's a little more mentoring than there is coaching. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little bit more 
um, I don't know, cultivation of their own awareness of. So you have to feed a little bit in order to kind of. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would, I would say I don't have that much experience with these, but when I have had them. Like one I'm thinking of a couple years ago, I happened to be talking to a really masterful coach about this. And her question to me was, or her observation was, it sounds like you're chasing this person around. Or you're trying to get them to somewhere that they don't want to go. What would it look like to just be with them where they're at? And just, you see all this potential for them and you see how they have this somewhat simple goal and how they're making it super complicated and you just want them to just get to their goal already. Let them be where they are. Get curious about what it's like to be them in this moment. To get to your goal, I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. Well, you hired me to get to your goal. Let's just get there already. Come on. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was so I guess for for the for the difficult person if there is such a thing, um again that's a story that's a story i bring to the situation this person's difficult well guess how hard it's going to be to coach them if i'm telling myself this person's difficult oh yeah yeah you're right. like that that's just this that's a self-fulfilling prophecy if there ever was one um so yeah i my best answer in this moment would be slowing it down and not trying to get anywhere and when they're ready to really move and go somewhere, they will. And I think there's also this notion of un- unknown impact. I don't, my sense from having done a few of these or one I'm thinking of in particular, I think I was having more impact than I realized mm-hmm. in terms of helping them get to where they wanted to go. But it wasn't on my own self determined what timeline of what it should take i think one of the ways that i and i learned this from a a a coaching supervision session i had with my own supervisor i worked with her for about three months and uh she would ask this question which i asked her permission to then adopt which was uh do you like living in a loop, Brad? And she had this look, quite a cheeky little smile. What's it like to live in that hamster wheel? <laughs> well, I was a little indignant, actually. Uh, oh, I bet. When, when she first posed it. Um, and uh, I got all defensive and, what do you mean loop? <laughs> And then restarted telling the story all over again, you know? And, and she's just laughing at me. Um, and, and, and I wonder whether there's a kind of quality as coaches we can engage in, which is kind of the gentle challenge. You know, the velvet and, hammer. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and we've talked before about my feedback style, which is, you know, deemed to be a brick and a flower at the same time. Here's my bunch of flowers, but be careful. Duck. There's a brick. <laughs> <Here comes the brick. laughs> right, right behind it. But that, that gentle challenge, that ability, and, and not everyone has it, right? Part of it is about your demeanor, uh, your own approach and style. And I know that there are times when I've used that question where I'm consciously smiling, I'm being a little bit cheeky. I'll even say to them, sometimes I'll even ask permission, listen, can I be bold here? And they're like, yeah, 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 be bold. It's like, well, look, this is the fifth time you're telling me that story. I feel like we're living in a loop. What's that about? And then I'll laugh and they'll laugh. And it's like, really, is it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> if I go back through my notes, I could tell you how many actual times you told me this story since we started working together. What is that about? What is going on? Who are you telling the story to? It's not right. me, because you've already told it to me. What's it giving you? Right. And then he goes back to the simple question. So what do you really want? 
And and I think uh, even not even take it out of coaching, but even in personal and intimate relationships, people we live with, family, kids, best friends. I think when they bring us those problems, those challenges, the two simplest questions that I've been able to integrate from coaching into sort of family and friends life have been, so what do you really want? Or, so what are you going to do? And, you know, when when somebody brings a problem, my nephew brought me a problem a few weeks ago. Uh, Brad, he sends me a text message, Brad, you got time later for a chat. Uh, something's happened today, I want to just run it by you. Of course. I'll text you as soon as I finish. I text. Call me when I'm on my dog walk, okay? So call up, chit-chat, chit-chat. And then, so what's what's going on? They tell me the problem. And all I said was, so what are you going to do? In this kind of almost inquisitive, childlike way, you know, so, well... <laughs> And off they went. And I went, oh, brilliant. That sounds like you know exactly where you're going. And I think as coaches, our only job is to help move people forward. It's not yeah. to help them solve things. It's not to help them feel better. It's to help them move forward. They'll solve it. They'll feel better. Yes. It's to help them move forward. And I think that's kind of, for me, it has always been the, the legacy I want to leave at the end of a coaching session. So when I'm coaching coaches, I always say to them, you know, simple questions, make it all about them. Intuition as well. Learn to trust it. And don't worry about what's the next great question. Doesn't exist. Listen, there are some, I call them magical questions. But what I mean by that is if you had a magic wand and could wave it around, how would things look differently? I don't mean it's a magical question that's going to change everything. Right. It's a magic question. <laughs> it's when you put your Harry Potter on and, you know, you get your wand out. It's your experiamus. For Harry Potter listeners, who uh, anybody else obviously won't, won't, won't know what that spell means. Including uh, me. Including <laughs> <laughs> I am not into Harry Potter at all. <laughs> I couldn't even finish the first book. <laughs> well, I only read the first book and then just watched the movies. But we know about both of us and books. <laughs> Let's not it's go down that route. <laughs> John, listen, take me full circle. Um, yeah, we started with this idea of you know, and you raise it, you know, coaching coaches. If there was a tip you could give to people training to become a coach or wanting to integrate coaching into their kind of communication exchanges and you're only allowed one tip not three what would be the thing you would say to people try this and see what happens ask permission oh i like that just give me a little bit of context before we wrap up today Ask permission. It, there's many dimensions to it. it. So it's the it's the idea of, and you, you used it, I think, a little bit ago. Um, and by the way, like that just popped into my mind. So that's me using my, in other words, in this moment, and it's so funny because now my mind is like, well, wait a minute, John, was that the best answer? Was that <laughs> the, and it's, but no, so I'm just, I'm just playing in real time to just say that you asked me that question and my intuition was like that. So for this moment, that's my best, that's my best tip. Um, what does it mean? It, it means, it means to slow things down. It means to check in with the other person to say, is it all right with you if I really tell you what I'm thinking? Or, you know, is it all right if I tell you the truth that I see here that might not be the truth? And it my I might not it like it's just what like can I tell you what I'm seeing? Or can I tell you something that might be hard to hear? And it's a way of slowing the conversation down for the other person to pause and say, see, I've never had anyone say no. <laughs> Maybe that will happen someday. So in some ways it feels a little bit like a fake question, but I also feel like it's a good speed bump 
for the other person to take to, to kind of like brace themselves a little bit and say, okay, John just stopped to say, do you really want to hear the truth as I see it? Which might not be the truth. Like, are you really ready for this? And then I feel like there's there's a space and there's also an openness to hear it. In and I mean this this I guess goes like what's so funny about with me with my wife is I'm like the opposite of most coaches where you have to like ask me to coach you. <laughs> so so she's a lot of times like, Will you just coach me? Come on, help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> but in situations where maybe you have the opposite dynamic where the other person is like, will you just stop coaching me all the time? Um, the pausing and asking permission can be a, can be that pause that just says, do you want coaching in this moment? Or maybe you need something else. Right. Yeah. It's like, I don't need coaching on why the car won't start. Just go, just go get me a new battery. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, and I totally uh, agree with it, concur with it, because I think that ability to ask permission means it's still all about them. Yeah, they can say no. I mean, we're all at choice. Nobody's ever said no. But I feel like it gives them the ability to like just kind of tweak something in their mind to say, OK, I have signed up for whatever John's about to say, even if I don't like it. Yeah. And that gives them a greater ability to actually hear it and be with it. Right. That's my theory. Yeah, uh, I love that. John, we've come uh, a really lovely full circle on, a, on an episode around coaching the coaches. We really need to plan these better because, I, you know, I just, we never really found our groove. <laughs> now that's what I think. These are so funny. We never plan anything. Like, <laughs> We've just learned that the minute we, well, this one was different, but usually we just push record. It's like, so what are we talking about today? And then we live in the moment. Maybe that's, maybe that's another thing to take from this too, is we're both, I think, just kind of jamming and following our intuition. Well, I, I think to that point, as two coaches, that's exactly what we do, which is mm -hmm. why we get away with it. <laughs> Long way to continue. <laughs> All right. Uh, will you come back before Christmas? Uh, do I have to commit to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. John Paul Scott. All right. Pleasure. See you next time. All right. Take care. Thanks, Brad. Bye.